Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Maureen Conway, a Vice President at the Aspen Institute and Executive Director of the Economic Opportunities Program. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's conversation, Procurement with Purpose, Improving Equity and Job Quality Through Public Procurement. This conversation is part of the Economic Opportunities Program ongoing Opportunity in America discussion series in which we explore the state of economic opportunity in the United States, the challenges workers, businesses, and communities face, and ideas for change. We're grateful to Prudential Financial, Walmart, the Cerdna Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Bloomberg, and the MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth for their support of this series. In today's discussion, we'll be discussing the opportunities and challenges of using public procurement to improve jobs and race and gender equity. State, local, and federal government spending on goods and services is estimated at over 2.1 trillion annually. And note, this is an update of our original figure inspired by a helpful audience question. So thank you to all of you who offer questions when you register. Um, in today's conversation, we'll talk about the societal benefits of this public spending. Um, but when we, when we think about the societal benefits of this spending, we often focus on things like the number of jobs created or whether small businesses or businesses owned by women and people of color benefit from these investments. These questions are certainly important uh, because, and particularly these questions of ownership because we know that ownership of business assets is a huge driver of wealth and that the concentration of the ownership of business assets is, is uh, one of the huge drivers of wealth inequality in the country. So expanding opportunities to participate in business ownership is essential as we think about race and gender wealth gaps. And we'll bring that into our conversation today. But there's also the job creation aspect of procurement and often missing from this conversation is whether the jobs created through public procurement are good jobs and whether access to the good jobs is that is supported um, is equitably. So to assess whether jobs are good jobs, of course, we need to have a shared understanding of what that means for a job to be a good job. And I just wanna note briefly that recently in partnership with the Families and Workers Fund, the Aspen Institute Economic Opportunities Program released a, a good def a, a definition of good jobs. And this statement was based on a review of over 20 good jobs framework, of focus groups with workers and with business and input and consultation with a broad stakeholder group. We were really trying to think about what's a broad overarching definition that can be shared across many stakeholders. And we recognize that there are a variety of dimensions that can contribute uh, to uh, what makes a job good in specific industries. But there were really three core pillars that that remained consistent across all of these frameworks and, and all of these stakeholder groups. So one of these pillars is that a good job provides compensation, wages and benefits that affords basic economic stability. Another, the second one is a good job offers opportunities for growth, to learn new skills, to advance to more challenging positions, to increase earnings, to build wealth. And the third pillar was that a good job has a culture of equity and respect, that workers race, ethnicity, gender identity, religion, or other demographic characteristics do not influence their access to opportunity for employment or advancement, that the work of all workers is valued and respected, that workers' ideas and concerns are heard and responded to, that there are systems that encourage mutual trust and mutual accountability um, within the workplace. So these were really the three pillars that were pretty consistent. They might be framed different ways and use different words, but those three concepts were really pretty consistent across the, the definitions and really felt, felt right to our stakeholder groups. So while many may find this to be a reasonable characterization of a good job, we also know that many jobs today would not meet this standard. In 2019, scholars at the Brookings Institute found that more more than 53 million adults, roughly 30% of the workforce, earn low hourly wages. In the midst of record levels of quitting that some have turned the great termed the Great Resignation, the Pew Research Center reported that the top three reasons cited by workers for leaving their jobs were low pay, but also no opportunities for advancement, and that they felt and the third was that they felt disrespected at work. So encouraging more jobs to be good jobs is certainly in the interest of workers seeking to earn a decent living and live a decent life, 
but it's also in the interest of businesses hoping to attract and retain the workforce that they need. And for these reasons and more, encouraging good jobs is broadly in the public interest. The idea of using public procurement to advance job quality has its antagonist though, who might argue that the government's role in procurement is simply to get the best deal for the taxpayers. But that view of a good deal ignores a range of other costs that the government may accrue if the well-being of workers uh, providing the goods and services that they're contracting for is not considered. Most obvious is that workers who do not earn enough um, are likely to have to rely on other public benefits such as food stamps, housing, earned income tax credit. So, um, so there's a pay me now or pay me later aspect. Um, but there is also a cost in the, in the quality of the goods and services um, received when worker well-being is not considered. Workers who are underpaid, lack benefits, don't receive adequate training, or suffer from other job quality deficiencies um, are likely to quit, uh, contributing to high turnover, maybe less productive. Um, and on the, on the flip side, research shows that workers in good jobs with family sustaining wages and the opportunities to learn and grow, um, they're more engaged, more productive, more invested in the success of the business and less likely to leave. So, um, and then the third thing to really think about is that fundamentally, we build a better society when our ideals of hard work being the path to a better life match a lived reality for all people, regardless of race, gender, religion, national origin, or other characteristics. We simply put, we need jobs to be good jobs. Um, these good, good jobs are good for workers, business, and the country as a whole. But the good jobs approach is not systematically embedded in public procurement. So why is that? And how can we shift government agencies to adopt this kind of philosophy in procurement? What would that actually look like in practice? And how can we make sure this is done equitably to ensure that um, procurement supports businesses owned by women and people of color, as well as good jobs for women and people of color? Uh, we've recently released a, a paper with a few of our idea, ideas. We'll drop that in the chat. Um, but we have a great panel today to talk about all these issues, and I'm so excited to hear from them in just a minute. But now I'm just going to do a quick review of our technology. All attendees are muted. We very much welcome your questions. Please pose questions at any time throughout the discussion. Uh, you can put the questions in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or upvote questions of of other people. We also encourage you to share your perspective. We know many people in our audience, as I mentioned by that good question asked earlier, uh, have a lot of knowledge of these topics. Um, so please share your resources, your ideas in the chat. Um, we always appreciate your feedback. Please take a moment to respond to our feedback survey at the end of this session. It'll open right up in your web browser when you leave. We're thrilled with participation in uh, today's event. Um, we'll try to get to as many questions as we can. We also encourage you to tweet about this conversation. Our hashtag is talk opportunity. If you have any technical issues, um, please message us in the chat or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. This event is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website. Um, closed captions are also available. If you need those, click the CC button at the bottom of your screen. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our panelists. Um, we have a great set of panelists. I'm just gonna do a quick names to faces introduction. There's more information about them on our website. Um, if you're not familiar, take a look. Um, uh, but just quickly with us today, we have Amy Saxton, Vice President of Program Development, the James Irvine Foundation, Paige Shevlin, Strategic Advisor for Infrastructure Workforce Development in the Office of the Secretary at the US Department of Transportation, Tommy Smith, Manager of Economic Impact and Impact Spending at Kaiser Permanente. And we're so glad to have Nancy Marshall Genzer, Correspondent at Mar Marketplace with us today to moderate today's conversation. Nancy, let me turn it over to you, thank you. Absolutely, thanks Maureen. Um, so everybody, I'm gonna have the three of you start by just telling us what motivates you, why you do what you do. Uh, Amy, you are my number one victim. So tell me a little bit about yourself, about the Irvine Foundation and why you think the conversation we're having today is important. Thanks, Nancy. Happy to be your victim today. Um, I am a daughter of an immigrant from Panama. My mother immigrated and was the first in her family to go to college and then complete graduate school. 
that strong education and good jobs as a physician for my mom and a cancer researcher for my dad allowed them to buy a house in Los Angeles in the 70s. That job income enabled my mom to bring over my cousins, my aunt, and my grandparents from Panama, and they lived with us, and then finally would make their way as they got their feet under them. That house enabled my mom to send me and my brother to college by drawing from their home equity. That was an example of that mythic American dream at work. I have never believed that that dream worked for everyone, but I do have a hope that it can. I joined Irvine five years ago because I'm passionate about our singular goal, which is a California where all low wage workers have the power to advance economically. We're a private foundation. I'm sitting here in Oakland, California, where we are now the fourth largest economy in the world. And yet, if you factor in the cost of living, we have some of the highest rates of poverty and economic inequality in the nation. Job quality and structural racism are huge issues Irvine needs to address. Maureen said it well. At the bottom, at the bottom, like most conservative, I would say one third of folks in this country suffer from low wages and poor job quality. But a 2019 Gallup poll showed that only 44% of folks would say they are in a good job. So the vast majority of folks working in our country today do not think they're in great jobs. And that is something that we must and can change. I believe we have enough wealth in our country and our state for every individual to have a good job that allows them and their families to thrive. That's what I want for my two kids and that's what I want for all of us. So why public procurement? Because it can be a very potent lever in demanding better job quality and achieving more economic justice and racial equity. Absolutely. Well said, thank you, Amy. Paige, you're next. I'm gonna have you uh, tell us about your work at the Department of Transportation. Uh, and why now is a good time to be having a conversation about procurement and job quality and equity. Absolutely. Well, my answer is easy because the U.S. Department of Transportation has $650 billion to give out through the bipartisan infrastructure law. And we want to make sure that all of that funding is distributed in a way that promotes good quality jobs throughout the transportation sector and brings in uh, populations that have traditionally been underrepresented in those jobs, including women and people of color, people who face barriers to employment, like people who have had involvement with the legal system or people with disabilities. So um, my job is 100% focused on uh, implementing these sorts of priorities into the bipartisan infrastructure law investment, uh, most of which is done through procurement uh, through our competitive uh, grants process. And I'm happy to talk more about that later. But those are the primary goals. Well, wow, thank you, Paige. Tommy, last but not least, uh, you are at the Kaiser Permanente. I want us to tell you, uh, I want you to tell us about yourself and your work and why procurement aimed at boosting job quality and equity is important to you. Thank, thank you. And so I'm with Kaiser Permanente, as you said, we're not um, a public agency, but we are the largest nonprofit um, integrated healthcare insurer and, and uh, care provider in the United States. And our mission is to provide high quality, affordable healthcare and to improve the health of our members and the communities we serve. So integral in our mission really is a focus on community health. And we like to feel that we are responsible not only for the health of the 12 and a half million members that we serve, but the 68 million people in our footprint. And we recognize that in order to protect health, um, we really have to leverage all of our non-clinical assets. Only 20% of an individual's health status is determined by clinical care. So we can have our members say in Southern California, both going to the same hospital, the Los Angeles Medical Center. And those that live in Beverly Hills will have a 20, you know, a longer lifespan than those that live in South Central LA going to see the same doctor. So if we're really gonna live up to our mission, we have to leverage the ways that we buy, build, hire, advocate, and invest in order to promote wealth and, and, and protect upstream health. And so my job here in working in impact spending really is trying to help us to leverage that supply chain and that supply chain spend and those supplier behaviors in order to help promote wealth in our country. My, wow. my, or in our markets. 
my, my, my passion behind this comes from, I don't want to date myself, but years ago when I was in the, in the Navy, in the submarine service, one would argue that our greatest existential threat to the United States was the Soviet Union and its nuclear arsenal. I would posit now that the greatest existential threats that we face are inequity and climate change. And inequity, health inequity, social inequity, economic inequity. And so here I am again enlisted in a battle against those existential threats in order to, to, to save the world again. And so I'm happy to be here and happy to talk with this. And we're gonna have you share some of your battle plans with us <laughs> in a little bit. Um, but right now, Paige, I have a question for you. Um, I want you to talk about some of the concrete steps the DOT and the administration are taking um, to promote good jobs and equity in, in procurement. Absolutely. Yeah. So we have, um, <clears throat> there's a couple of different types of funding that we have, uh, like all agencies, you know, we have our, our formula funding that goes directly to transportation entities, uh, to states, to port authorities, to transit uh, entities. Uh, and then we have our competitive grants. Uh, and of that 650 billion that I mentioned, we have 125 billion to award through competitive grants. And uh, we have made the decision for the first time to put job quality and workforce development into our uh, criteria for all the competitive grants that the US Department of Transportation is putting out. Um, and that means that uh, there, you know, there in typically in, in these grants, there are, you know, four or five different criteria. Sometimes there's as many as eight. Um, but one of those criteria will be around uh, job quality and workforce. And very specifically, what we want to see from applicants is really not that different than the Aspen job quality framework that uh, Maureen was talking about. Um, our goals uh, are uh, three Fold. Again, very similar. One is how are they creating, how are the transportation entities um, planning to create good paying jobs with free and fair choice to join a union? And then second, how are they expanding high quality uh, training and education programs uh, with a focus on underserved communities? So that's kind of similar to that mobility piece. Uh, and then how are they implementing policies that will promote the hiring and retention of underrepresented workers? And all three of those uh, components are extremely important. We actually just put out a checklist for potential applicants on how to create strong uh, workforce and labor plans. And we did that because we really wanted to emphasize those three components um, all coming together. And I would really spotlight that last one, uh, which I, I think is, you know, again, similar to the, in the Aspen framework, this piece around, uh, you know, equity. Uh, you know, we can, we can, build lots of workforce programs, um, but we have to change the way that we hire and retain people in the transportation industry. Otherwise, we're going to continue to see the same results that we have now. What are the results that we have now? We have a disproportionately white male workforce. And the jobs that do have more people of color and women tend to be the lower paying jobs, right? Jobs like, for example, in, you know, airport concessions, jobs in, uh, you know, transit bus drivers, for example. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of work to do, both on making sure that we are opening up access to those higher quality jobs, and then also raising the quality level of some of those uh, uh, lower uh, paying jobs. That's great. Um, and 125 billion, that's a good chunk of change to, uh, to be spending. Tell me about those battle plans. Uh, I know that uh, obviously Kaiser Permanente is, you know, and not a government organization, but I think the government could learn a bit of from, you know, learn from what you're doing. Um, if you can talk about your philosophy behind uh, government when it comes to promoting good jobs, and um, you know how you put that into practice, and um, you know this is also has to be good for the bottom line, right? Not just good for society. Sure, and and we like like the government and and um, I would say educational institutions, higher educational institutions, what you call anchor institutions, and so. Um, and I think of the analogy of when um, Amazon was looking for their second headquarters. And it kind of demonstrates how private capital can go anywhere you know, it needs to for whatever reason. But the, the University of California, Berkeley down the road, the Oakland Medical Center, 
the city of Oakland government aren't going anywhere. So there's an enlightened self-interest to really, you know, leverage the way that you spend, you hire, that you build, all of those operational assets and leverage them in order to support, support those communities in which you're anchored in. And so we, as a large hirer, a large purchaser, a large real estate holder, and just as a part of the community, really look to make sure that our spending decisions are environmentally sound, economically viable, and socially equitable. And so, you know, that's our philosophy really is to be a good community um, anchor. And it does help our bottom line. You know, we're in the business of insurance. And like any insurance company, you want to make sure that people buy the product and not need it. And so we're about preventative health. The preventative health happens outside of the four walls. It's making sure that folks have enough and have the wherewithal to afford healthy food, um, to afford um, suitable housing, um, to have the um, time for active living, for exercise, and all those other things. That keeps people healthy. And so that's our philosophy. It really is around community health and closing those health wealth gaps and so we have a very strong philanthropic arm, our community health um, program, which are great partners in the work that I do. But we also look at, you know, how do we spend, not just how do we give, but how do we spend and how do we do our operations in a way that is a benefit to that community and ultimately to us because we reside in our anchors with the community. Huh. So healthier people, less health care needed. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, Amy, your turn. Um, obviously, you've thought a lot about this. So how would you define equitable and inclusive procurement? And what are some strategies and principles um, that you have identified that need to be in place before that can actually happen? I'll build on what Paige and Tommy just said. I define equitable procurement as contracting and purchasing, but it tends to multiple aims, not just lowest cost. It attends to who, who are the business owners and the workers, and especially are they black, indigenous, people of color, or others who are often excluded. Two, it attends to the job how, how well does this business actually demonstrate quality job outcomes, not profess or announce, but demonstrate quality job outcomes, especially for women and people of color. And I originally thought this might be out of scope for today, but I'm delighted by what Tommy said earlier. I also think it attends to the planet. How, how well does this business demonstrate practices that leave the planet healthy and more resilient? Um, to me, there's four principles that underpin that and really allow that to flourish. One is equity attending to equity in all forms throughout all the time. The second is simplicity. I think the procurement paper that Aspen has drafted does this, conveys this principle really well. And full disclosure, Irvine was a funder of, of that effort. Um, but data that better informs procurement decision needs to be readily available, practical to collect and meaningful. And it's one of those places where I think we really can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good enough. And then I would say thirdly, accountability. There needs to be real consequences for better job quality and better equity practices. It means you win, you, you get the contract and you know why you won and what you need to do to continue. I hope the communication and the consideration of that allows for a race to the top. And then lastly, this is probably the most important principle in my view, and it's a value of Irvine's is humility, which really means how do we listen to low wage workers who are going to best understand what they need and what they can offer and where we can create more dignified, sustainable, humane work that also advances the bottom line of the company. So you think the government should really spell it out here? I do, and I suspect, though I haven't clicked it yet, I'm very curious to click Paige's link in the chat and see how some of those things have been specified because um, it needs to be lined up at every level at the, in the rules and in the implementation and in the accountability and who has power to hold us accountable for these very promising advances we're making and the rules and the expectations. Yeah, because then it's quantifiable, can be measured. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, Tommy, back to you. I want to drill down on some specifics. Um, if you can give us some examples of your work that, um, you know, achieved these outcomes, but also some challenges that arose um, when you were using procurement to, to try to, you know, help employ employers improve their job quality. Sure, and 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 I, I think uh, you know a chief challenge, particularly in, in in the healthcare supply chain, is cost. You know, um, you know we really seek to make healthcare affordable, and we do that by getting getting the best products and services at the best price. But it's not simply the cheapest price; it really is about value. You know, and we want to make sure that we're um, getting products and services that are best for our members in their whole aspect, in their total health. So that, you know, we're, we're buying environmentally sustainable um, products. We have a goal around environmental sustainable purchase or environmental preferable purchasing. Uh, we are, um, we just declared um, a net zero goal for our um, aspiration for 2050. Um, we have a lot in, uh, in, in spend with um, local diverse, uh, suppliers, because we know all of that has a spinoff benefit for, for our communities and ultimately their health. And so when we look at cost, you know, we think about, okay, what's the, the best value, but also how can we help you know, our supply chain get better? You know, so I mentioned our community health department and, you know, we give grants to organizations that can help, particularly some of the smaller suppliers and diverse suppliers who may not have a lot of sophistication or how can you be more efficient in your operations so that you can invest that um, savings back into your in, uh, workforce? And, and we also work with, and you know, some of the things that we're doing now is that we're adding job quality as part of the KPIs, key performance indicators in um, contracts, because we need to have suppliers that are resilient. And we know that uh, suppliers that have quality jobs are better performing and more resilient. So we're asking about turnover rates and retention. You know, we want to make sure that you know suppliers, just like everyone else in the community, have access to healthcare and 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 the benefits that that um, provides for the community. So we're really looking at this holistic picture of how do we drive supplier behavior and help them be more efficient and understand the benefits of job quality for their performance and their own bottom line and for ours. And, and, and just finally, you know, I think our supply team is understanding that if you want to do business with us, you just can't sell us stuff. And so there's an expectation that, you know, if I really want to, to get that KP contract, then it's more than just best price. I have to demonstrate best value throughout my operations, you know, quality, service, environmental impact, social, and impact as well. That is so interesting <clears throat> because that's, that's exactly what Amy was saying. <clears throat> and Amy, feel free to jump in here if you'd like, but you're just saying, you really spell it out. You say, we want A, B, C in that KPI. This is what you have to do if you want our contract. Yes, and it, it's, it's, a, it's a growing body of work for us because um, we really want to make sure that we're understanding, you know, what the social term itself, and we want it to be a benefit for the, the supplier as well. And so you, you think about like um, our, our staffing company, you know, and uh, we use a lot of staffing and a, a lot of nursing clinical staffing as well as non-clinical staffing. If those staffing companies, you know, um, invest in the pipeline, then they have more human capital to sell to us. And so, you know, what type of work are you doing in those communities of color where there's underemployment? Because we need people. You know, one of the issues that's facing healthcare writ large is, you know, the shortage of staffing. So we need folks and there's high unemployment in areas in our community that's impacting health. So it's a win-win. And so partnering with our staffing company to help us solve those issues makes sense and it makes business sense for them because then they have products to sell to us and to other consumers of human capital. Tommy, just one more thing. I didn't hear you, maybe I just didn't hear it, <clears throat> but I didn't hear you talk about some of the challenges 
that have arisen for you when you're trying to use procurement in this way? Um, well, I, you know, I, cost is always the, the big challenge. I think most um, supply chains are looking to drive down costs. We have some very aggressive cost saving goals year after year. Um, and so that that's probably the, the, the biggest challenge is really, well, how do we do all of these things and make sure that we are, you know, optimizing cost? And, and, and then there's also just, you know, it's a new ask for suppliers. Um, they're used to delivery, negotiating delivery and, 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 and product size and all those technical things. And when you ask them about, about job quality and wanting to make that a KPI, it's like, hang on a second, let me get out the red pen. And there's a back and forth, like, no, no, we really want this. And we really need to have this and we can help you. And so sometimes it's not just simply, we're gonna put it in your contract, but let's sit down and let's figure out how we can work together and then set up metrics that make sense and then demonstrate to your shareholders and stockholders and stakeholders how this brings value to you as well as to the communities that we serve. Yeah, because they are interested in the bottom line, aren't they? Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, Amy, want to learn a little bit from you, from your work um, at the foundation. Um, what have you learned about the challenges of shifting employer and business practices to support good jobs and equity? And what does it take to make that happen in your experience? Well, one, I'm just so inspired by the work Tommy is doing at Kaiser. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm learning a lot from you. Um, why did we come to focus on employers and shifting their practices? It's a really simple answer. Employers have an enormous influence on the work and daily work experience of about a third of low wage workers, you know, a third of workers in this country who are low wage workers. In California, that translates to 4.3 million people. And we also believe and have evidence, uh, as, as Tommy was describing very eloquently, that you can, companies can make different choices and reap a profit. And you see this from companies in the exact same sector and geography. So we invested in a study, for example, by an organization called the Shift Project. It was out of Berkeley, now it's out of Harvard. Um, and it was about retail because such disproportionate numbers of work, low wage workers are in the retail sector. And what you see is very profitable companies with a completely different worker experience. When you go to Trader Joe's, you feel the happiness of the workers in and out. It's a totally different experience than the way workers are treated in terms of wages, benefits, advancement opportunities, dignity, scheduling predictability than when you're at a dollar store, for example. There's a, a report on that. If folks are interested, I'm happy to share it. So there's enormous influence and it's possible to do something different that values workers and advances the bottom line, period. So what does it take? This is a very complicated question I'm trying to boil down into like 90 seconds. Um, in my opinion, what it takes is employer motivation, employer know-how, and a more conducive environment that really helps employers with the motivation and know-how. Let me actually start very briefly with the last one. I tend to believe that many people are good, well-intended folks who are making reasonable decisions in whatever systemic context they're in. So how do we improve the environment to have more job quality, more equity? One example, small businesses that are BIPOC owned have lack of access to capital. We did a study about half of these businesses in LA would say we don't even have a formal banking relationship. So how could they be positioned to take on big infrastructure contracts where oftentimes they're floating payroll until they're reimbursed and they don't have that access to capital to, to do that. So there needs to be different financial mechanisms. And a lot of folks have thought about this and there are examples of this, but there are really practical, pragmatic things we can do to make the environment more conducive so the employers can feel the motivation and have the know-how to take advantage of, of some of these opportunities. The second thing I would uh, offer is power. Um, we can use carrots and sticks to increase that motivation. Now, let me be really clear. There are those goodwilled, really committed actors. I think that's most folks. For them, let's, there can be some carrots, like I said, capital for small business that can build in incentives and technical assistance for job quality. Irvine's made some investments in that front. A second is um, sticks. I wanna recognize that there are employers whose business models are predicated on wage theft, 
on extracting from the planet and from people. Now, for those actors, you need better enforcement of labor laws and more demands made by organized workers who have power to actually force change. Let me end with employer know-how. There's such a potent opportunity right now. Companies have an opportunity to listen and share power with their low-wage workers. There's a wealth of ideas and experiences for how to improve the bottom line while increasing quality. We've invested in this. Um, I can put the link in the chat, uh, an organization called Talent Rewire that actually published a toolkit on how can companies right now set up the conditions to listen to their frontline and entry-level workers and engage them as partners. So to bring it back to today's topic, I see inclusive equitable procurement as a real carrot that helps increase the motivation and hold employers accountable for outcomes. It's very exciting. And Amy, I just have a little follow-up. Um, does this have to cost more? I mean, you were just saying one thing they can do is just listen to their workers. That doesn't cost anything. Does this have to cost more? I don't know if I have a simple answer to that. Probably, I don't mean to be um, obscure, but it probably depends on what you mean as cost. Like I will say some of the things that have unlocked the motivation for Irvine to do more on racial equity has, has cost more in terms of time um, devoted to really understanding history of racism and how that is baked into some of our systems and prevents certain populations from advancing economically. So there has been a lot of emotional labor and effort and time spent that could have been spent on other things. But to me, it's critical to spend the time and effort to build the motivation and a shared alignment and understanding that then allows sustained change to happen, if that makes sense. I hope I'm answering your question, Nancy. Yeah. Anybody else want to say anything about that? Does it have to cost more? You know, I, one of the things about costs and, and you know, for us, we think about brand equity. And so I, well, I'm gonna speak for myself, but I think our organization would be really reticent to work with a supplier that was a bad actor in the marketplace. Cause then that would reflect badly or could reflect badly on us. And so, you know, and we need to protect our, our in our own workforce, we have practices that uh, provide job quality. And how bad would that be if, you know, in our supply chain, folks who are coming in and, and supplementing our operations didn't also share that quality and, and how that would affect our, uh, our brand equity. And so there's an added benefit to this. There's a cost of not doing this. You know, there's a cost of not getting those public contracts or those contract with anchor institutions like your hospital systems and your educational systems that um, have a reputation to protect. And they're not going to let a supplier, we wouldn't let a supplier jeopardize, you know, our access to the health records or our, our technology. We're not going to let them jeopardize our, our equity, brand equity as well. And, and job quality is a good way to help protect that brand equity. Yeah, your reputation is everything. Yeah, hey. I could jump in here too on the, on the cost factor. Uh, I, you know, I definitely think that if we do some of these investments in job quality and workforce up front, then we can see some you know, positive outcomes on the end. One thing I haven't touched on is just in terms of the U.S. You know, federal government's direct procurement, right? We also have a new um, you know, executive order around the use of project labor agreements on any uh, procurements over 35 million. And you know, many people would say that costs more, right? We would say, no, having a project labor agreement is a way to ensure that you have the workforce you need, that you're not gonna have any you know, workforce stoppages and that you get the work done on time uh, and uh, so that does take an investment up front, though. I think I, I think it would be um, you know wrong to uh, negate that, right? There are investments that need to be made up front in uh, getting uh, you know training the workforce and also in um, some of those accountability pieces, right? We need to have the investments in research and data uh, to be able to track how we're actually doing on meeting these goals of bringing in more underrepresented workers into the workforce. Yeah, absolutely. And Paige, I want to stay with you for a minute and just have you share an example with us of the DOT's procurement approach in, in ensuring um, equity and that, you know, these dollars are supporting good jobs 
um, and some of the challenges that you've seen in implementing that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, what I would say is that we are really early in the process still. So of that $125 billion in competitive funding, I would say we've probably awarded maybe seven, maybe $10 billion of it, but not much more than that. Uh, and uh, we are seeing uh, that in those funds that we are awarding, uh, Every time we put out a grant, uh, uh, there are more and more uh, winners that had really strong uh, workforce and labor plans as a part of their application. Uh, we are seeing a lot more um, transportation entities that are taking on the use of local and economic hiring preferences. Uh, this is a really important tool that uh, is permissible now. Um, it was actually put into the bipartisan infrastructure law to allow the use of economic hiring preferences. And it is a way to preference hiring of people who come from economically disadvantaged areas or people who have characteristics that make them economically disadvantaged, such as, you know, not having an education beyond, um, you know, uh, high school or uh, being on public assistance, being a, uh, you know, single head of household. Uh, so we we are seeing more transportation entities that are taking on um, you know, the use of, of that tool. Uh, and we are, of course, working to provide technical assistance to the winners of these projects you know, that um, help them uh, learn how to use uh, economic hiring preferences and how to do registered apprenticeship and, and some of the other pieces that we are encouraging. Uh, none of these projects are going to break ground for a while. Uh, and, and that's one of our challenges is that it's a long uh, process. Uh, I think, you know, Amy was was um, talking about this, that, you know, it's not just the awards, it's also what we put in the grant agreements, right, that we actually sign on the dotted line with the transportation entity, and then how do we track the uh, outcomes. And I think for the federal government in particular, you know, that back end piece is, is one of the most, uh, uh, one of the biggest challenges, right, because we are the Department of Transportation, and we are not necessarily accustomed to uh, tracking uh, workforce and, and job quality outcomes on projects. Now, luckily, some of that is already jurisdictionally the job of the Department of Labor, right? The Department of Labor has an Office of Federal Contract Compliance who is responsible for tracking compliance uh, on federally assisted projects. And we are working very closely with them. And one of the things that we are doing actually in our grants is we are requiring that our grantees uh, be willing to fully partner with the Department of Labor on that compliance effort. Uh, so that's an example of where we're trying to make sure that we get that back end piece right as well. Uh, and you know, just to point to some uh, specific examples, uh, I can put this in the chat, but from our most recent uh, infra awards, uh, we had a number of awards that have really great workforce plans. You know, one that I would call out that I, you know, I think just does stellar work is uh, New York City. New York City uh, has a whole ecosystem of workforce um, uh, development programs, uh, including a program, for example, that is focused just on um, women, non-traditional employment for women, and they have agreements that you know, twenty percent of the um, apprentices on a project will come from. That program for women. 10% of the uh, workers, you know, of the apprentices on a project will come from the program that focuses on people who are coming out of incarceration. So that's a really um, direct way of making sure that uh, those projects are getting the workers uh, from those disadvantaged communities. And uh, the other challenge that I just wanted to mention is just, I think, you know, at this point, we are still trying to make sure that people know that this is a priority for the Department of Transportation, that we are, uh, that we are focusing on this. And that's why we put out the checklist that I uh, referenced uh, and are trying to, you know, do a lot more um, engagement because ultimately a lot of the accountability for this is going to come from community, right? If a community sees that a $100 million project or even, you know, uh, a $500 million project is awarded in their community and, you know, they were supposed to do X, Y, and Z. Ultimately, I think, you know, the community uh, needs to have the tools and the knowledge to hold that project and, and the local government who's really sponsoring that project accountable. Yeah, and Amy, I see you shaking your head. I saw you nodding when Pedro was talking about tracking and accountability. I mean, how important is that? You can... You can say a lot of nice things, but then you have to be, you know, the numbers don't lie. You have to be accountable, right? Yeah, I I, I was doing a lot of head nodding and I'm also inspired by the work you're doing, Paige. Um, that one of the things that I think is 
critical and an opportunity for philanthropy to jump the gun, Nancy, and perhaps an upcoming question, but is to invest in local community-based organizations, especially those that are BIPOC led and serving so that they have the capacity to influence what is getting built in my community, who is building it, the owners and the workers, and hold those who are in power accountable to the actual better job quality, more racial equitable outcomes. And that is non-trivial. Um, it's all, there's so many funding streams with so many different rules and community where I used to run a community organization, keeping track of that was not my, it was like, can I make payroll? Let me go fundraise, let me get on an airplane. It wasn't, can I track the rules? So capacitating community-based organizations to do that is critical and is a real opportunity right now for philanthropy. And I just, there's so much promise here and I don't want to be a downer, but I do think it's worth noting that it's, We've been talking a lot about who gets to build and how do the workers who are building um, have opportunity. Some communities, when I've been list, trying to listen to communities, are just still at the point of what are you going to build in my community? Because the last time and oftentimes when this happens, you raise my community and you put a freeway between my Black community and the job opportunities. So you know, this is all, this is important. And we need to meet communities sometimes where they're at, where there's a big piece right now also on what is getting built here. And are you actually listening to me and what I want to see built in my community as well as who built it? Yeah. And Nancy, if you, if you don't mind, I would love to just, um, cause I, I really appreciate this uh, you know, holistic uh, definition of equitable development that both, you know, Amy and, and Tommy are referring to. And so uh, I do want to uh, go outside of my lane a little bit and just, uh, you know, say that for DOT procurement overall, uh, we have um, really, you know, uh, four top priorities, right? Number one, uh, most important is safety, right? And procuring so that the projects that are being built are that we have safe roads and that, you know, people are not um, uh, getting, you know, for example, killed in crosswalks. Uh, so uh, that is, you know, top priority. Uh, second is, uh, you know, wealth creation, uh, you know, through all the work that I'm in charge of, as well as through um, small and disadvantaged um, uh, businesses. And then climate change, uh, you know, certainly that is a, a you know top goal for the Department of Transportation and making sure that uh, we are uh, reducing, um, you know, mitigating the impacts of climate change and especially for disadvantaged communities. And that brings me to the fourth goal, which is really, I, I wanna get at, you know, what Amy was just talking about, right? We wanna see our transportation dollars being um, spent in more disadvantaged communities with more engagement from those communities. Uh, and one of the programs that I am most excited about is our Reconnecting Communities program, which is specifically meant to address uh, those um, transportation uh, uh, projects in the past that have segregated communities uh, and how do we you know, redress that um, harm that was done in the past. Uh, and I'm so excited for those awards uh, that will be made next year to combine both, you know, the the, the transportation side of addressing um, those harms, but then also to bring in this wealth creation piece. Uh, Tommy, uh, you've been quiet for a little while. I want to ask you about how you track progress, how you measure progress, uh, and also, you know, where is Kaiser's work in this area headed in the future? And are there any final things you want to talk about, you know, about how the government can learn from your experience. Sure, sure. So we we, we track, um, not only do we track our amount of diverse spend, we also track the percentage it represents of the entire um, uh, supply chain spend. Uh, we track our environmental preferable purchasing spend. We also look at the job creation that comes from our spend in our markets. And, and, and then we also measure um, and this is our, my professional goals. We also measure uh, the amount of technical assistance we provide um, to suppliers, uh, diverse suppliers in, in our um, ecosystem. You know, so we talk about access to capital, coaching and other resources that are philanthropical side of the house funds. And so, you know, those are the things that we're tracking. And we're looking at other measures too. And we're working with some of our larger um, corporate suppliers on their um, social responsibility efforts and how they're partnering with us. And so we're starting to measure things like um, uh, retention and job quality factors in our security force, for example, which is um, something that we contract out. 
Um, and so we're looking at those type of measures. And that as we go forward, you know, and I saw in the chat uh, a question about worker ownership. And so one of the things that we had been piloting or demonstrating the past year and a half or so is a program which we're educating um, you know, diverse suppliers, uh, particularly those companies owned by owners that are getting close to retirement age, about worker ownership as a succession plan. And that's a great way to create uh, a broader sharing of wealth amongst that company and keep that company within the community, providing what we would presume to be quality jobs because now those workers are owners. And so we're looking to, to, to scale that work and also partner with some of our other healthcare um, colleagues in an organization what we call the Healthcare Anchor Network, um, where uh, we're part of, I think there's 70 healthcare systems that are part of this Healthcare Anchor Network. And you know, we're looking to bring this idea to them so that they can spread it in their communities. Um, we're also you know, always looking at how do we expand job quality in our supply chain. And so we're looking at, okay, what about our laundry? And what about our food systems? And what about our janitorial? And these things that may be coming up uh, for contract um, renewal or bid in the next uh, few years. And how are we instilling job quality in those requirements right at the request for proposal stage so that companies are put on notice that, oh, wait a minute, I have to come with more than just simply you know, cost per pound or or whatever that, you know, financial metric is that, you know, there are other requirements that are going to be weighed heavily, or at least, you know, as all things are equal, that that will be the differentiator in getting that KP contract. Very specific. Yeah. Um, Paige, I have one last question for you, and then we're going to, uh, I'm going to ask some of the questions that have come in from our audience. Um, but I'm just wondering in the years ahead, what are some of the things that we should be looking for to assess whether these investments are indeed um, creating, uh, you know, improving jobs and race and gender equity? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, number one, in terms of you know, our projects that uh, DOT is funding, uh, I expect that we will see more and more projects that um are using project labor agreements that you know um, have uh, union partnerships, and uh, that is the best way to ensure that those are good quality jobs. We also want to see that there are you know that there's more diversity on those projects. Uh, that gets back to that tracking challenge that I talked about. Sometimes it's hard for state and local entities to track uh, what exactly is happening on their project, but. I do believe that with such a major investment coming from uh, the federal government that we should be able to, you know, not next year, but uh, five, six years from now, we should be able to see changes in the in the construction workforce, at least overall, right? We should see more women in the construction workforce. We should see, uh, you know, uh, more black and brown people in the construction workforce, and especially in the construction workforce paid at higher wage levels, right? Because right now, uh, where there are people of color in the construction workforce, um, they are paid less. Uh, and uh, so we want to see that change across the entire construction workforce. And I do believe that if we um, continue to focus on this and the way we are from the federal procurement side, we can have that impact across the entire workforce. And the Labor Department will help you measure And that. yes, and, and especially if the Labor Department continues to help us. And then they can do some of that tracking on the, on the back end too uh, from their uh, procurement and compliance side. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to get to some of the questions from our audience. They're excellent. Um, Paige, this one's for you. Uh, how is apprenticeship being used in federal procurement to support good jobs? So apprenticeship. Yeah, so in that checklist that I talked about, right, uh, number one, uh, good paying jobs with uh, free and fair choice during the union. And then number two is expanding high quality training and education programs. Uh, registered apprenticeship is uh, the a definition of a high quality training program for us. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if, if applications are focused on expanding registered apprenticeship, uh, then, uh, you know, that's really what we want to see. And specifically uh, to get into the procurement, right, we, we want to see apprenticeship utilization rates. Uh, so that the project owner is saying 20% of the uh, 
project workforce are going to be apprentices or 15% are going to be apprentices uh, because that allows for us to have those slots to train the next generation of workers uh, and to offer those really good training opportunities uh, to the workforce because registered apprenticeship, we know there's a, a standard wage progression. Uh, we know that it's linked to, um, uh, uh, to the you know, employers and the unions involved. Uh, and so that those people are gonna uh, be able to progress through into journey level status. Thank you. Um, this next question is for yeah, anybody. Can I chime in on this really briefly? Yes, please do. It. Go. Um, I, we have been a huge investor in apprenticeships for all the reasons that Paige mentioned. They are just the gold standard of quality job, mentorship, pay while you learn, opportunities for advancement, credentialing at the end that's recognized by multiple employers. It's a really exciting model. There are some challenges to it. It's hard to get to be a registered apprenticeship and there are earn and learn models. So there's an opportunity to um, invest in both. Um, I would point out that when I was coming up to speed in this space, I have still a long way to go, um, but it was hard for me to understand how does all this fit together? What does it mean if I'm a low wage worker and I'm supposed to become a pre-apprentice then an apprentice and then a journeyman and then with whom and do I even trust my local union? They might not have been doing me right, perhaps historically, or I don't see a lot of pe people who look like me in that union. So there's a lot of stuff there. I would just re reference folks to, um, it, you know, we funded this, so full disclosure, but we um, helped invest in a, what we call the gold standards playbook for workforce development. It's really asking, sort of codifying what to pay attention to if you're um, a project owner and ensuring that at the end of the day, you're actually advancing folks who've been traditionally cut off from these kinds of apprentice union, high quality jobs. What does it look like kind of from the worker's point of view and for the project owner's point of view? And that's important because uh, apprenticeship is, you know, very, very important, a good way to get your foot in the door. Um, this question is for anybody, and we've sort of touched on it a little bit, um, but what specific data and metrics should we look at in our decisions around procurement? Anybody want to take that one, Tommy? What specific data and metrics should we look at in our decisions around procurement? is the question. Sure. And, and, and so, you know, you always start with um, the kind of, and there's an acronym I'm going to mess up, but the, the, the words of it are assurance of supply, quality, um, um, service, delivery, price. You know, those are kind of table stakes. You got to have those. And, and then we start looking at the differentiators. And so, you know, many um, companies, because we buy a lot and we buy in large volumes, it's really difficult for a company to kind of distinguish themselves. And, and you don't, if you're a supplier, you don't want to have that race to the bottom line where you're just competing on price. And so when you look at things like, and talk about things like job quality, environmental performance, the entire ESG, environmental social governance performance, that can really distinguish your company uh, when we make those decisions. And so we've always had a decision process, particularly on the clinical side, where we look at the best clinical performance and the assurance of supply and the quality and those other factors before we look at price. And now increasingly, we're also looking at well, where are your workers located? And, you know, are you creating employment in our community? You know, and, and you know, what's your environmental performance? You know, are, if you're creating pollution problems in our community, we, you know, we're probably not gonna to wanna to do business with you as opposed to someone who's at least committing to a performing, uh, improving that performance. Because ultimately it comes back to us I and mean, we're, we're part of an ecosystem called the planet. And, and if you're a supplier to us as we're trying to provide healthcare and you're acting in such a manner that's you know, contracting the great clinical care that we're providing because you're pushing all those other wrong levers, well, it's expensive for us to do business with you. So we're really looking at how do our supply chain and suppliers can impact the social determinants of health. And, and that's factoring more and more into our decision-making. That is so interesting. So it's not necessarily the, the person offering you the best price. Well, and, and let me be clear, we do make sure that we're trying that's to keep important. healthcare affordable. So yes. you know, affordability yeah. is very important. But it could be a distinguishing 
um, factor, you know, all things being equal, particularly a price, that one company that's performing better environmentally and socially will be the one that will find it. Uh, and tell me, there's a question specifically for you, and it's about how employee ownership fits within equitable procurement. How has Kaiser Permanente worked to support employee ownership in its supply chain? Sure. So specifically, we've been working with um, two groups, uh, Project Equity and, and the O'Brien Collaborative, and they have partnered together to do what we call our, our, our demonstration project, we call um, Business Resiliency in the Supply Chain. And, and it really is focusing on worker ownership. And so this year, we've helped two companies. Well, one is still in the process, but I can talk about CCH in Hawaii. And they do last mile distribution for us in Hawaii. You know, we, we buy a lot of stuff. It's hard to get it to the island. And then once you get it to the island, to get it to the medical center. This company has been a diverse owned company, African-American owned company, that's been a supplier to us in Hawaii for years. And Nick, his small one, the owner is starting, you know, at retirement age. And he's always had a goal of selling the company to his employees. And so we were able to help him do that. And so now going from this one diverse supplier to 70, you know, diverse owners of this last mile distribution company and making sure that they're supported and maintaining their business in our supply chain. And we're looking to do that with other companies as well. And so that's like one really specific example of how we're looking at, at, at employee ownership as a model of supply chain resilience, wealth creation, and maintaining supplier diversity um, status within our supply chain. Thank you. That's a wonderful specific example. That's people can really relate to that. Um, Paige, the next question is for you. Uh, how is DOT responding to arguments that agencies must choose the lowest cost proposals to protect taxpayer dollars? Yes, uh, that's a good question, uh, and uh, gives me the opening to make sure that everyone understands that yes, we are we are giving grants to states and localities, and then they are doing the direct procurement. So it's a little bit different, uh, you know, we're one step removed from the direct procurement. So when they do the direct procurement. Um, they do have to have low cost uh, provisions uh, to, you know, pick the lowest um, uh, cost bidder, but it is the lowest cost bidder that uh, meets all the requirements of the RFP. And so, you know, if the RFP is very clear that we want to have a diverse workforce on this project, we want to use local and economic hiring preferences, we want to have a project labor agreement, uh, then they're picking among the, you know, the, the lowest cost bidder among projects that are responsive. So it's still the, the best way to look at it is the lowest cost responsive bidder, right? And that gives you a lot of leeway to put the, you know, everything that you want to see in that project uh, into the RFP. That's interesting. So as you say, the states are in charge of you the know, state the localities, transit authorities. I mean, when we give competitive grants, it's open to, you know, all kinds of eligible entities. Uh, and, you know, many of our grants are going to city departments of transportation, for example, or transit agencies. Uh, and, you know, I did want to point out, I, I think that's the way to, uh, you know, in, in terms of our procurements for those intermediary um, entities, we are focused on both the good jobs piece and the uh, diverse hiring piece. And I think that's the way to address the concerns that, you know, uh, that Amy was raising about, you know, uh, people who, you know, uh, have uh, been, you know, disadvantaged through the current system in the past, right? So, you know, when we're looking at project proposals, yes, we're looking at whether they include registered apprenticeship, but we're also looking at whether or not they include a plan to bring in diverse workers into that apprenticeship program, um, as I gave with the example of the New York City program. Uh, and then once we get that from them and we award the funding based on what they put in the grant to us, then they have to put that in their procurement. Uh, and then they will be looking for the lowest cost responsive bidder to that. And you're going to be watching. <laughs> I mean, it's that is the biggest challenge, as I said. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of grants, right? The U.S. Department of Transportation has honestly uh, never put out this much, you know, funding at once, right? And so that's a challenge for any agency to just scale up so much and to uh, be able to, you know, track all of that. Uh, it's it's hard for me to honest to keep track of how many awards we put out already because it's a lot. Well, good luck. <laughs> 
Uh, let's see, this question is for anyone, so you can fight over it. Um, how does supporting workers to join unions and union contractors fit in today's conversation? Um, I'm happy to try to address that. A lot of, a lot of infrastructure, especially built infrastructure like roads, bridges, tunnels, what people might envision when you think infrastructure is often built by union um, workers. Um, you know, the, the trades is what it's often colloquially referred to, carpenters, electricians, et cetera. Um, and unions have historically been a place where you can, where, where you have worker power, right? Because you have a collective of workers who then have the scale to demand better quality jobs. So I think unions are an integral part of this because many of the, the infrastructure, these trillions of dollars and billions of dollars of infrastructure come into, dollars coming to California are ultimately going to be, um, the workers will likely be disproportionately union workers. So then the question becomes, well, who are who is inside unions and how are unions doing on the same things we've been talking about, like bringing in folks who've tended to be disadvantaged, BIPOC uh, trade unions have historically been disproportionately white, Paige mentioned this earlier, and male. Um, it's why Irvine, we've been investing in models that do pre-apprenticeship to support workers to have the kinds of skills that allows them to even get in the door with the union, like focused on women and people of color. One of those in California is called Winter, Women and in, um, in Infrastructure and Technology. I'm not getting the acronym right, my apologies. But they focus on women and people of color having in, in, in construction jobs specifically. Um, it's a big gap, it's really important. We're also investing in how do unions um, partner more deeply and authentically with community-based organizations who have the trust of their, their residents, particularly residents of color, to also understand where the unions need to change internally in order to recruit, retain, and advance people of color, assuming they have a commitment to doing so. So unions are very integral to this conversation um, and a key player. Yeah, if I could add on to that, uh, definitely, uh, unions are extremely important and, uh, you know, it is, uh, a, not a secret, uh, and, you know, something that we are proud of in the Biden and Harris administration that, uh, you know, we want the bipartisan infrastructure law to create more union jobs. And, uh, I, what I, what I said about the construction industry being disproportionately male and white was about the industry as a whole. Um, the best evidence that we have is actually that, um, unions are uh, that, you know, the projects that uh, are union projects are more diverse than non-union projects. Uh, it's, it's a challenge across the entire industry. And uh, we also want to make sure we are approaching these twin goals of having a good, you know, good paying jobs uh, that, you know, offer benefits and are safe uh, and also having the diversity. And I just don't see how we get to that without unions, right? So I think we have to um, continue to move forward with encouraging uh, you know, these jobs to give workers um, bargaining power and then also uh, work with unions, as Amy was saying, to make this workforce more diverse, both through pre-apprenticeship programs and these sorts of um, you know, collective bargaining agreements that go beyond the traditional project labor agreement and are what some people would call community benefits agreements or community workforce agreements, where the agreement spells out how that is going to benefit the community overall and specifically how it's going to benefit the underrepresented communities. And I completely agree too that we have a lot of work to do in increasing partnership between uh, unions and community-based organizations uh, and, um, and, you know, I, I think there's, there's a lot of value uh, for philanthropy and, and other stakeholders in, in helping to do that. Um, and this question is, touches on something that we've already talked about a little bit, but how do you actually validate what businesses tell you about their job quality? Anybody want to tackle that one? Well, if, if it's a part of their KPIs, you're meeting with them quarterly. And you're looking at it just like you're looking at delivery rate and 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 invoicing and, and all those issues. And so um, 
you know, is how you manage the contract, you know, and make, building it into the contract, it becomes a, a data point that you just look at every quarter and they have to report, you know, progress or, or otherwise could, you know, sometimes with some contracts write you a check because they're not in their KPIs. And do you, and not you personally, but does Kaiser ever go out and visit a job site and just try to verify that they're doing what they say they're doing? Uh, for all types of um, products and services, um, particularly in healthcare, because, you know, it, it's so essential that we, you know, get the product and get it on time and that, you know, suppliers are living up to their, their contract terms. And so, um, you know, we engage in whatever type of contract compliance um, validation is necessary to make sure that, you know, people are living up to what they agreed to, to provide us so that we can serve our members. Um, Nancy, I'd love to add to this. Um, I uh, really appreciate what's happening at Kaiser on this front. I think that there's um, momentum, which is really exciting. First of all, how does one verify job quality? More broadly, across the sector or the, the country, there isn't an accepted definition, but I think we're making a lot of progress there. Maureen um, referenced earlier the work of the Family and Workers Fund to sort of align on a definition of job quality. Just what even is it? And, and how do we measure it? There's work now happening around a job quality measurement tool. And then how does that become consequential? I think that's the key question is the con how does it become consequential? And that, that happens, I think, inside some of the you know, procurement systems and organizations like Kaiser. And I would hope that there's an opportunity in the, the S of the ESG metrics that there becomes more of a commonly accepted approach to looking at this. So there's also leverage from investors. We are going to invest or not invest based on what we understand to be the job quality offered by employers. Um, that still has a ways to go for sure, but that's my hope is that it um, becomes less idiosyncratic employer by employer or funding stream by funding stream and more of something that um, can be used the way that the E and ESG has evolved. So kind of a carrot and a stick. <clears throat> um, I think we have time for one last question, uh, which is uh, why does the government uh, continue to fail to meet many of the procurement goals around supporting small businesses and those owned by women and people of color? Anybody want to tackle that one? That's a tough question. Paige? I'll just ref, oh, sorry, Amy. go ahead, Paige. It was directed towards the government. You should start. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I will try and give an answer that's maybe a little bit too vague, but I think we were lucky with the bipartisan infrastructure law that they uh, did a lot of clarification, for example, around the use of local and economic hiring preferences, which addresses how we can uh, have you know workforce goals for underrepresented communities. I don't think there has been the same sort of type of clarity for small and disadvantaged businesses. And uh, they're, you know, first of all, they're kind of all lumped together normally, even though we know that like women-owned businesses face different challenges than Black-owned businesses, right? Then, uh, and um, and also, you know, I saw this comment in the chat at one point, but it, it gets a little bit caught up in, uh, you know, the arguments about race-based preferences. And there's a lot of um, concern about, you know, making sure that, uh, that we are focusing on that, you know, um, disadvantaged piece. Uh, and uh, and I, so I think sometimes people are just kind of afraid to do it uh, and they don't understand what they can and cannot do. Uh, and unfortunately, the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, didn't clarify any of that in the same way it did around local and economic hiring preferences, where we know that we can use them. Uh, and uh, and actually, you know, that, that under the right circumstances, we can also use certain... Um, uh, uh, targets based around even race, if, if, if it's done under the right circumstances. Huh. And Amy, I think you wanted to chime in here a little bit. Um, I'll just mention that there's um, some research we funded that for me was really helpful in understanding what some of those barriers actually are for women in BIPOC owned small business. And some of them are I'm not, it's not that they're not complicated, but they're very addressable. Um, so we can perhaps put in the chat, there's a it's a bit of a dense report, just full disclosure, it's dense, but it, it offers sort of what are, what are business owners who are BIPOC or women that say is preventing them from being able to access some of these big infrastructure contracts. And um, the second thing I would point out is again, 
there's also that that to me gives um, recommendations for making the environment more equitable and more um, hospitable to employers, you know, doing different things. The, the second thing I'd point people to are um, an equity and infrastructure project um, that we've been honored to be a part of where large public agencies across the country are committing to increase the number, size, and proportion of their contracts that go to businesses that have historically been excluded. And that's an opportunity sort of to publicly proclaim what they intend to do and then share practices with each other and report back and increase hopefully accountability for making some of those changes. And there's three in California who've committed to the pledge, but there's there's also others across the nation. I think that's just a really exciting um, development to watch. And that's, an, yeah, that's another way of looking at it is, well, what are the requirements? Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, everybody. This was really fun. I learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you all. This is fantastic. And um, uh, yeah, you guys got a, a lot in in a short amount of time. Um, I just want to mention for our audience's benefits, our, our speakers today have been a wealth, not only of knowledge and insights, but also of references to reports and things that could be useful to the audience. So we will try to curate a list of those for everybody and include it in our wrap-up email about this event. So, um, so stay tuned for that if you didn't manage to write down all of those reports. Um, so we'll try to try to share those out in that way as well. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for your comments, for your questions. Thank you, Amy, Paige, Tommy, Nancy, this was a really fantastic discussion. Really appreciate your time. I want to thank my colleagues, Amanda Finns, Mark Popovich, Matt Helmer, Tony Mastria, Merritt Steuben, Victoria Prince, and Leilani Flint for all of their work in helping produce today's event. It takes a lot of us actually to put these things together. Many thanks to those of you who were tweeting about things on today on social media using hashtag top talk opportunity, great comments and um, questions from everybody. Uh, please, again, do take a moment to uh, respond to our feedback survey. Please join us January 19th for Economics Reimagined, a discussion on building a human rights economy. But this is it for 2022 from us. So thank you all for being with us. It was great. Happy holidays and hope to see you all in the new year. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>